Hello, Facebook, and welcome to the Royal BC Museum. I'm just going to quickly put a slide up before we get started. Um, this is our final uh, mini orchid tour here, the fourth and final one. Um, and today we're going to be focusing on the very final piece of the gallery, which is our shared future. Um, the Royal BC Museum is located on the traditional territories of the Lokongan speaking people, Songhees Esquimalt Nation. And it is my honor to live, work, play, and especially learn here on these beautiful lands. And I encourage you to know more about whose lands you're on today. The Royal BC Museum is located up in Canada on the West Coast on, in British Columbia. And there's a little dot there at the very bottom of Vancouver Island that shows where the museum is located. And I'll show a quick photo of what it looks like from outside. And now we're gonna join me again back into the exhibit. Hello everyone, my name is Jenny Arnold and I'm a digital educator here at the museum. And as I was saying, this is our final installment of our little snapshot, little mini tours of the Orca Gallery. Um, and I'm again joined with Mark Learn Young, which I believe I can spotlight for him so he, so he can say hello. Hello, Mark. <laughs> Hello, Jenny. It's great to be back virtually at the museum. Yay! Wonderful! Yay. <laughs> I'm going to quickly go back to me. So where I am right now is in where the captivity section is. But today, we'll be going into our shared future. So when we first go, and I'll flip the camera around. So Mark, do you want to get us started talking a little bit about um, why orcas are important? Why do we need to protect them? Well, it's interesting. As somebody who makes uh, movies and has been writing books about orcas, if you're zooming in and, or beaming in to see us right now and you're on Facebook Live watching us or watching this in reruns and you're on the West Coast, you're going, of course, orcas are important because you grew up paying attention to orcas and oceans and, you know, we're all following the latest plot twists in the story of J-Pod, K-Pod, and L-Pod and, and the Amazing Southern Residents in the news whenever there's something new happening. We know those stories, we, we know those orcas, we know their names. But doing what I'm doing, whenever I'm outside of the West Coast, people are like, well, why should we care? And the reason we should care, aside from because they are awesome, uh, is that we really do, as the museum exhibit says, share this future with them. The orcas are the apex predator in the oceans. And if the apex predator in the ocean can't survive, if the orcas can't survive in the oceans, then we can't survive. And the threats facing the orcas right now have to be overcome, not just for the orcas, but for us. Like what Jenny's showing you right now is plastic pollution, which we all know exists. You know, you've all gone out. If, if you're on the coast, if you're near a lake, you've seen water like this and it's horrifying and you know but at the very least we're looking and we know what plastic is but what's happening now is that plastic doesn't really disappear it kind of shrinks it basically degrades to the point where it gets tinier and tinier and tinier and ends up in the food chain and right now Orcas are eating plastic, whales are eating plastic, fish are eating plastic, and we're eating plastic. And that's not a happy thing for anybody. Um, the chemicals, the, pollutions in, the pollution in the water, that all passes up through the food chains. The higher, higher any animal is in the food chain, and this includes us, the more toxins we are eating. So, you know, there's mercury in so many fish right now and the orca are eating those fish we're eating those fish so what you're seeing right now are the pollutants that are threats to all of us and one of the things that i love most about this exhibit is that it is called our shared future and it really acknowledges that we are sharing the planet with these orcas and you look here's an image of the fish that we are taking out and one of the things that is so hard to wrap our heads around now uh, is that humans get used to whatever our reality is now. There's a theory called vanishing baselines. 
Uh, Daniel Polly, a scientist out of UBC, talks about this. And vanishing baselines is, we get used to the idea that whatever is there now is what has always been there. And it is so easy to forget that in my lifetime, the size of Chinook salmon, which is what Southern resident orcas feed in, have gone from huge, these huge, huge, huge abundant fish, the point where they are endangered. Salmon have been the cornerstone species on the, of the Salish Sea for pretty much ever. And now we can barely find them because we've polluted the oceans. And so that's pollution, that's overfishing, that is climate change, that is as this lovely sign from uh, that, that lovely sign from a young orca lover says, that is oil and water. So that is there's the threats from pipelines, tankers, ferries, everything up there causes some degree of pollution. And and as we've talked about in the other exhibits, orcas don't experience the way the world the way we do. They see about as well as we do, but their primary sense is acoustic. So imagine how loud that is for an orca. And I've been lucky enough to meet uh, some of the top acoustic experts for orcas in the world. And they talk about how phenomenally difficult it is for orcas to do their thing, for them to, as Jenny's showing you now, navigate, find prey, and communicate. And one of the terms that I've heard used is the cocktail party effect. But, you know, nobody's going to cocktail parties these days in COVID. But think about having a conversation in a loud kind of place a gym, an event, anywhere that there's a loud crowd with lots of people and lots of noise. That's what the orcas are dealing with when they're trying to communicate, when they're trying to say, hey, there's a salmon over there. Well, they're not hearing each other. And if they can't hear each other, that means they also can't find the salmon as easily. That's the Southern residents. Uh, for the bigs orcas uh, who hunt mammals, same thing, they count less on communication, but they still count on echolocation to find their prey. So we're making it more and more difficult for them to find less and less food, let fewer and fewer things to eat. And to me, the real symbol of this, and the whale who to me is the heart of this exhibit is Scarlet. And you saw the life-size model of Scarlet earlier in the gallery, and that scarlet there, and you can see that little indentation uh, on the back of her head. And I think scientists are great at a lot of things. Naming is not one of them. And uh, one of the worst names scientists have come up with is peanut head. And peanut head is a name for that little indentation there. And that little indentation there, peanut head sounds cute. It is not cute. That little indentation makes, basically is a sign that a whale is starving and it means they're low on blubber. And so Scarlet was, at the same time the world was watching Tahlequah carry her dead daughter for 17 days, uh, orca experts were watching this little whale, Scarlet, slowly starve to death. And there are different theories on why Scarlet was malnourished, but this was a three and a half year old orca who was vital to this population. She was one of the first females born in ages and was spunky and fun and funny and had so much personality. And what happened was people were so inspired to try and save Scarlet, try and work with, to try and find some way to fight basically her starvation that the Canadian government, the US government and the Lummi Nation teamed up with almost every orca expert out there to try and figure out whether Scarlet needed medication, food, what could be done to rescue this amazing little whale. And really by the time they set out to do this, it was too late. And eventually we lost Scarlet, which is one of the great tragedies that I've seen in somebody uh, telling the stories and trying to share the stories of these amazing whales over the last several years. And, but the flip side of that is the death of Scarlet 
and the attention paid to Tahlequah is one of the reasons that the Canadian government, the US government have both put a whole lot of regulations in place to start paying more attention to the orcas. And, you know, I love those images of orcas being carried at protest marches. I've carried those orcas at protest marches uh, to raise awareness for these whales. And what's happening now is they are now very much the icon of the need to fight pollution and the need to fight for healthier, safer oceans, not just for the orcas, but for all of us. And, you know, I think if you ask people casually what they think the threats are to orcas, the southern residents especially, the threats that really come up, people, because they've seen blackfish, think captivity is an issue. It's not out here. We haven't been catching whales in a very long time. Um, there's an orca skull. Thank you, Jenny. Orca skulls are so cool. It's not captivity. It's, you know, whale watchers are not getting very close to the southern residents, although whalers who aren't paying attention are. Uh, not with sorry, not whalers, uh, civilians, so boaters who aren't paying attention are getting way too close. But southern residents aren't really being on the agenda for uh, professional whale watchers these days. But that doesn't mean ferries aren't getting close to them, and tankers aren't getting too close to them, and people in their own boats aren't getting too close to them. So people are out in their own boats have to be really careful about getting too close to whales. The other part of that is there are all sorts of regulations around people getting too close. Those regulations aren't always enforced. So you want to help the whales, help remind the government that you care about them. And what Jenny's showing you right now is one of the places that we can watch, excuse me, that we can watch whales from land. We can watch these orcas from the land. This is Saturna Island. This is East Point. And we talked about Moby Doll uh earlier this is where Moby Joel was harpooned from Eastwood because that is how close the orcas get and if you hang out there you've got a decent chance of seeing an orca come up really 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 close which is kind of amazing uh there are some places in the San Juan Islands as well and there are places up and down the coast where you can see orcas from shore and the museum has all of those uh those links for you and I'll show them in the Facebook page and if anyone ever asks about these things you can always find me at orcaseverywhere.com or on my site and I'll happily share orca information for you um yeah, if anyone has any about, questions please put them into the chat so we can get to those definitely oh oh absolutely and I you know I try and share stories about the threat store because in a podcast uh called Scanna and you can check out Scanna named for the you know the first orca in captivity or who inspired Greenpeace uh, to the Vancouver Aquarium and the amazing sculpture outside of the Vancouver Aquarium. This is Luna's story. And Jenny, I think you wanted to say something about Luna's story here. Yes, I just quickly want, I'm going to play it, but we're not going to watch it all. There's an amazing story about this orca. Um, and there's just a quick little clip in the gallery, but we actually have the full remastered version of it at the IMAX theater right now only for a limited time. So if you want to know more about this amazing um, orca that really changed people's perception and also made people really think of different perspectives people have for orcas, definitely check that out. But I wanted to just show you that there is a small little clip in the exhibit as well. Is this the version that's narrated by Ryan Reynolds? It is not. That, is, oh, okay. that one was a, a different one, um, but this one is the, the one in the IMAX and this one is the original version of Oh, the wow. Yeah, Fantastic. definitely. <laughs> it's an amazing movie. And, you know, we should mention that if you see this exhibit live, there are all sorts of fantastic videos uh, in the various rooms telling more stories about the orcas and, and diving into greater depth you know, on these stories. And yeah, speaking kind of of one, this one's a really interesting interactive that when you pull up, you can see the type of sound that specific boats make. But you can really tell that the difference between these and how it would affect orcas if they were swimming around there. It's almost noticed that this was not as loud as the other one. And another yeah, one is uh, in the very center over here. When you have to try to figure out how to make this little population, this little world fit, as you can see, there's like tankers and boats, there's oil in the water. If we move this away, that will change the center and makes it a little bit more happy. And so we kind of talked about the 
the things that are affecting orcas, which is a lot of the things that affect us with pollution, overfishing. So what can people do to protect the orcas and our oceans? I think one of the biggest things people could do really and truly is make sure that everyone knows that you care because to my mind, the attention paid to Tahlequah, the attention paid to Scarlet, that moved regulations. That governments found money to start worrying, up to to start to dealing with some of the threats to the orcas. And so, if you share your passion for the orcas, if you share your passion for nature, then that becomes a priority for the people who can have a real impact on it and there's there are like some there's some great surveys at the museum that do this again just trying to get a sense of what people are caring about and like it says they're working together so if you're paying attention to this exhibit you're tuning in tell more people about the orcas you know talk about what you saw here talk about what inspired you here and jenny's going by something that really inspires me i am Bill Reed's really my favorite artist in the world and that was before I fell in love with orcas and there's a beautiful Bill Reed quote this is a a screen that he created and you'll see that on the very top of that screen is an orca and there's a wonderful Bill Reed quote that is uh, engraved on the orca scan out the sculpture outside the bank for aquarium that he made it says above all else is God above god is the killer whale and i love that he's got i love the idea of orcas above all uh here and in that quote i find that really inspiring and one of the other things that's really inspiring we're going through the exit here and i love that this is set up so you actually have orcas kind of saying hello and goodbye here and this is the motto of the exhibit, our shared future, orcas need clean, quiet oceans and pollution-free food. What about you? So caring about orcas and caring about the future of the orcas is caring about our future too. Um, and because of the pandemic, the, you know, there, this has been, this exhibit was planned to go up. This exhibit was set to go up long before it did. And one of the things that I think is beautiful that the exhibit did was celebrated the births of the Southern resident orcas uh, who've come along since this exhibit was put together. So these are the new orcas or the newest members of J-Pod and K-Pod and Alpod, the newest Southern residents. And again, let's pay attention to these orcas. Let's learn their names and share their names and really just share our love for them because that is the trick we protect what we love and if we share that love we'll you know more attention will be paid to their environment more attention will be paid to making sure that they have the salmon they need to survive or the other prey species they need to survive Thank you so much, Mark. Is there anything that you would finally like to say about any of the exhibits or a big takeaway that you would like people to have that you haven't already said? I so hope people will be able to check this out. And if you can't get out to see it live, please check out every episode of this to get a sense of what's here. Because I was lucky enough to get to work on this exhibit for about three years, I was invited to consult on it. And I know how much love and care went into selecting all of this and sharing the lives of these orcas. So, you know, please do what you can to share their stories and follow their stories. Oh, thank you. There you go. Thank you everyone for joining us here at the Royal BC Museum. Um, this was a series of a couple of little short tours and we offer 
full length digital field trips here at the Royal BC Museum. Um, if you're interested in that, there is a link up on the screen right now. Um, but again, thank you everyone so much for joining us here. I hope you learned a little bit more about Orcas and the museum as well. And thank you, Mark. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Jenny. It's a treat to be able to talk to all of you. Yay. Bye-bye, everyone.